Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to everyone. I am Professor Julia Farr, and I'm a Senior Research Associate at the Center for International Forestry Research, C4. I trained as an animal ecologist and my research focus are, is on wildlife use in tropical and subtropical regions. I welcome you all to the presentation of the white paper and associated policy brief. This is called uh, Build Back Better in a Post-COVID-19 World. These documents have been produced by the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program, SWM, a consortium composed of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the French Agricultural Research Center for International Development, the Center for International Forestry Research, and the Wildlife Conservation Society. The SWM program is a seven year initiative of the Organization of African, Caribbean, and Pacific States, OACPS, and is funded by the European Union. We're now living in a life-changing pandemic. COVID-19 has infected millions of people all over the world, challenging public health systems and negatively affecting economic growth. Given the direct and indirect impacts of emerging diseases such as this one, health, safety, and sustainable development solutions are required. We need to learn from this pandemic by better understanding the root causes of zoonotic diseases, prevent future outbreaks, and support a green recovery to build back better. The COVID-19 pandemic has once again highlighted our close relationship with nature, and more specifically, the issues related to the use of wildlife as food. Wild meat is an important and traditional source of nourishment for millions of indigenous peoples and rural communities, particularly in tropical and subtropical regions. However, around 70% of the emerging diseases and almost all recent epidemics originate from animals, in particular wildlife. But it is a trade in wildlife, especially in large urban areas, that is increasing the risk of zoonotic disease transmission. However, draconian measures to restrict or even completely ban, ban hunting and the use of wildlife products in all situations, not just in cities, will have serious adverse impacts on families with no other option but to eat wild meat. At the same time, failing to take into consideration the increasing risk of zoonotic spillover may lead to more frequent pandemics in the future. This is a complex situation, and therefore we need to call for a sound risk assessment and for appropriate measures adapted to each country. These must be combined with global strategies and coordinated efforts to more efficiently address the question of why infectious diseases are emerging and re-emerging. At the same time, we must improve how we prepare for and respond to future zoonotic outbreaks. In this meeting, we will discuss how our white paper can help development partners and decision makers to know better why spillover of disease occurs from wildlife to humans and why zoonotic outbreaks such as COVID-19 can spread and become epidemics and pandemics. We will also provide examples of how an African country like Gabon and separately how indigenous communities in Guyana have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We will also discuss how future spillover events can be prevented, detected, and responded to. But before we start, let me give you all some guidance notes on how to engage in this session. 
For those of you who need translation, please click the translation button, button at the bottom of the right-hand corner of the Hoover platform and select the language you require. From now on, you are invited to post your general reactions in the Hoover chat, and most of all, your questions to your speakers, to our speakers. We will address these in the question and answer sessions. Please don't forget to indicate the name of the panelists to whom you wish to address your question, but also contribute to upvoting a question that you, um, you're most interested in by simply pressing a thumb up button next to the question. Both the chat and the question and answer session are on the right of your screen. We're very keen to hear your views, so please participate. We have quite a number of uh, participants already sort of um, linking to us, but it's now time to start uh, our session. Let me present the agenda before we go on to our invited speaker. We will have opening remarks, uh, uh, which will be given by Ms. Maria Elena Semedo, who's the Deputy Director General at FAO. We will start with the first activity after that to present the white paper with four distinguished speakers, then followed by a poll and a question and answer session. We will continue with a second session to discuss how we move forward on implementing recommendations and build back better. We have another three distinguished speakers followed by a second poll and a question and answer. At the end of this, we will close the event with a few words by Ms. Christelle Pratt who is the Assistant Secretary General of the OACPS. We will have a wonderful time together. This is sounding sort of very much like a political discourse now, but I have the honor to invite Ms. Maria Elena Semedo to give her opening remarks. Ms. Semedo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Julia. Good morning, good afternoon to all. Dear participants, I have a very great pleasure today to open this session on tackling the risk of wildlife borne disease pandemic and to launch the white paper on policy brief, Build Back Better in a post COVID-19 world, reducing future wildlife borne spillover or disease, of diseases to humans, I think is a very important team and it will be a very good instrument to policymakers. The Sustainable Wildlife Management Program, it was launched in 2017 by the European Commission and the Secretariat of the Organization of the African, Caribbean and Pacific States uh, and its four partners, as it has been already mentioned by Julia, CIRAD, C4, WCS and FAO and none of them needs further introduction. I would like to thank uh, the European Commission and ACP Secretariat for their continued support and confidence in the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. The SFWM program has already achieved a lot in these first three years to increase the sustainable management of wildlife and their habitat but also to improve the well being of vulnerable rural families in 30, 13 participating countries. Over the last few months, the program had to be adaptive and reactive in the light of COVID 19 outbreak and include a new focus on the transmission of wild borne disease to humans. In this regard, I would like to thank the European Commission in particular for their financial support to complement and strengthen the One Health approach, building on existence, uh, existing SWM program and starting with the preparation of this comprehensive white paper that colleagues will present 
in detail shortly, and I think Julia made the first introduction. The white paper was produced in a really short period of time. And this could be achieved only through bringing together the complementary competencies and experience of the four highly effective and specialized organizations, CIRAD, C4, WCS, and FAO. And I take advantage of this tribune to applaud all of you who has been involved in the preparation of this white paper. Dear participants, colleagues, the white paper assess the zoonotic risk along the wide meat supply chains, from the forest to both rural and urban consumer, and provides recommendations to assist countries to build their capacities to predict zoonotic risk and to set up measures to prevent and mitigate those risks and their consequences on the public health, food systems, and biodiversity. This white paper will help us to learn from the current pandemic, and in particular, on the role that ecosystem can play in building back better agriculture, agriculture sectors. In order to reduce the human wildlife and livestock wildlife risk of zoonotic diseases spillover, we must avoid further ecosystem frag fragmentation and restore and sustainably manage product productive ecosystems and landscape. And I believe the white paper provide very good recommendation and examples and how we should avoid these further um, zoonotic diseases to arrive. And achieving environmental sustainability, food security and poverty reduction is our priority. But we must continue to work towards a vision of truly sustainable agriculture systems. And I think every day now we talk about the food system, the transformation of uh, the agri-food system, and this, uh, this is also very important. And I think this paper can contribute to the next food system summit. Uh, and I was seeing that it brings us a truly sustainable agriculture system that minimizes the exposure of humans and livestock to wildlife related pathogens all along the wild meat chain. And COVID-19 is a global crisis. And for that, it requires a global response. Therefore, we need to work together and we need to stay in the front line to address and tackle emerging infectious diseases and the animal human environment interface. I believe this paper will be a very important piece for the decision makers and will be now important to see how to implement the recommendation in the paper to go beyond the white paper, but to move towards decision making and implementation. I look forward to your recommendation and let's continue work together to avoid a new uh, zoonotic diseases to arrive, a new pandemic to arise. Thank you again and congratulations to all of you for your contribution and all the panelists. Unfortunately, I am attending a regional conference for Africa is one of the very important FAO conference. I cannot stay with you until the end. I don't like that the people, the colleagues will listen to me and I will not be able to listen to you, but really uh, I apologize for that and I wish you a successful meeting. Thank you, over to you, Julia. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Elena. That was wonderful and we will miss you. Uh, we'll, we'll tell you about the meeting later. Okay. Um, <laughs> We will now proceed to our first technical session that, that um, will present really the white paper and the policy brief in more details. Um, the links to those documents have been posted in the chat box, but we are going to have four speakers who will lead us into um, the essence of, of these two particular documents. Um, 
We're going to start with Philippe Maillot, who is the head of sector biodiversity and ecosystem services in the Directorate General for the International Cooperation and Development, part of the European Commission. We will follow that with uh, Marisa Perry uh, from the um, um, ASTRE, which is part of CRAD, the Animal Health Research Institute, um, Deputy Head of ASTRE. Um, Amanda Fine, um, Associate Director of the Wildlife Health Program of the Wildlife Conservation Society, WCS, and ending with Keith Sumption, um, Chief Veterinary Officer, Leader of the Animal Health Program at FAO, and Director of the Joint Center of Zoonoses and Antimicrobial Resistance. These are all very long words that I've got to fit in before you talk, all of you. After the presentations, we will have a short session in which we will ask the audience to participate in the poll. Uh, basically around the specific question that we have posted already, and we will open the floor to answer your questions. Again, please um, post your questions, um, you know, uh, during the question and answer session before that and vote for the questions you would like to, to uh, for us to answer. Philippe, um, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Julia. So, uh, thank you. So, uh, so I uh, represent the European Commission here and uh, we are with the uh, ACP uh, State uh, Secretariat, really very happy to, 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 to present you this white paper. Uh, of course, the COVID pand uh, pandemic has really illustrated how societies are very fragile with uh, such uh, new uh, events. And we definitely need to learn much more about what happened in the last, uh, in the last year. We are now in the middle of the second wave in Europe. It's quite dramatic in some countries. And so we, we must be extremely uh, focused on that. The first uh, utility for us of this white paper is really to understand uh, the root causes of uh, these pandemics and uh, the transmission of this one, but uh, also many others uh, from uh, the wildlife to, to the humans. That's really the, the first point, and I think it's extremely useful for all decision makers. But of course, it's not enough. We need also strong recommendations. And when we discussed on this white paper, when it was proposed by the by the uh, Sustainable Wildlife Management Program to us and to the SCP Secretariat. It's really clear that uh, it was uh, essential for us, uh, the two kind of decision makers, if you want, of this program, to have something specific of this program on the link between pandemics uh, and uh, wildlife issues. We know it's not, no, we have to take clear decisions. It's not only a question of wildlife issues. We know that, of course, the health system is something extremely uh, at the front of this, uh, of this new epidemic. But what is important is really to, to have a holistic answer. And for that, since we are now in the European Commission at the beginning of a new programming cycle, so we have to program activities for the next seven years, it's really important to have an integrated response from different fields, uh, but starting by the probably to prevent the root causes of the pandemic that will be explained later on. So of the link with the natural resource of halting deforestation, uh, preventing the, uh, the, the big, uh, the increased contact between uh, the wildlife and the, and the humans. That's the first part. Second part is also to provide a better food, but in the in, uh, let's say, in a respectful manner for the environment. So the, all the issue of agriculture, agroecology, is also part of the answer to prevent future pandemics. The uh, link with the green economy, because of course, when the population is poor, the conditions are really uh, bad and the pandemics, the transmission of the pandemics is much, uh, is much faster. And finally, we have also to, to fight uh, some uh, issues that uh, Julia has mentioned. So the fact that 
we cannot uh, ban or reduce drastically uh, the trade of wildlife because the livelihood of many people depends on the livelihood that's of the wildlife sorry that's a point that we need really really to to, to concentrate and to understand exactly the 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 consequences of uh, all the measures we are taking so this is why actually the the swim project or sustainable wildlife prog uh, management program but uh, swim it's probably easier to pronounce for me uh, it's really a special program for us because for, it was one of the, the unique programs where in the same time we tackled the food security and the biodiversity conservation. In many, uh, in the past, in many programs, we had, uh, we had uh, some uh, local uh, development of local uh, communities and so on, but it was a bit marginal to the, to the central part of the conservation. No, what we have done is really in this, uh, in this program, we have built the program on the link between food security and biodiversity conservation. And that's why we have also tried to, to build uh, a strong consortium of different partners with different skills, different cultures. And so it was sometimes a bit difficult, but clearly we have a FAO with all the mandates on, uh, on the, the food security and uh, also the normative part of, uh, of FAO. We have the CIRAT and C4, two research centers uh, dealing with forest issue, but also with food security issue. And we have uh, the, uh, the WCF, also the Wildlife Conservation Society, a traditional uh, non-government non organization based on science. And so this is really for, for us a unique uh, composition of unique, unique consortium of organization that is really uh, well placed to answer to, to uh, to, to the question uh, we are really uh, on the facing. So, and it is really even more important than ever when we see in many countries the uh, distrust, the mistrust of uh, the, the, the general public for the, the experts here, because sometimes, especially in the health issue, because some experts do, do not uh, always agree. Here, what is really unique in this white paper and the policy recommendation that it was there was some debate huh, internal to the consortium which is normal because not everybody has exactly the same opinion but at the end of the, the day uh, they arrived to a really a strong position that is really well balanced where we have adapt, which is adapted to the local context so can uh, provide local answers but also in a coordinated manner so uh, with some uh, with some uh, global uh, coordination so i will not be much longer than that uh, i would like to really to congratulate all the authors of the the two uh, the two uh, documents of so the policy recommendations and the white paper this is clearly a big priority uh, for european union you know that in December last year, we had the, the European Green Deal, which has really changed the, the way that uh, the European Commission uh, is approaching uh, the, the link with nature. Many of us, we were convinced uh, that uh, this part was not maybe uh, visible enough in, uh, in our policies. Now it is the case. So uh, the Green Deal is really one of the top priorities of the European Commission, if not the first priority. And biodiversity is one of the, the most important pillar uh, of the uh, Green Deal. So this is really essential. It, has, it was really a game changer, this uh, communication and the Green Deal. And now with the COVID, we have now the, this green reco recovery and we know that we need a green recovery. So it's not just a global uh, an economic recovery. It's, it must be a green recovery. That's why this document will be really essential for, for the next uh, the next programming, but not, not only the, the next programming of the cooperation, but really the, the policy of the, of the European Union in general. So thank you to all of you. We are really very supportive of this uh, white paper. And I think that the, I'm sure also that the, uh, I would like also to, uh, to, uh, to thank the ACP uh, Secretariat, so the Organization of the African, Caribbean and Pacific Country uh, Secretariat, that's really 
uh, an excellent collaboration that we have uh, with uh, OECPS on this uh, program. And, uh, and, and I finished actually, I don't want to add more. So no, uh, Marisa, I would like to give you the floor. Well, thank you very much, Philippe. Uh, so good uh, morning, afternoon, evening to everyone. Um, it's uh, my great pleasure to be here to uh, present to you the scientific findings or the messages that we have summarized in this white paper. Um, and first of all, about what is uh, disease emergence? So what do we know? So as Jula reminded us, three quarters of the pathogens are zoonotics, which means that they transmit from animals to humans. And this is the case for the current coronavirus pandemics. And it's always been the case for influenza viruses, which have all emerged uh, from pandemics uh, throughout the years. So how does that work? So there is uh, one or multiple spillover events, of, uh, which means pathogens uh, transmit between wildlife or domestic animals to humans. Uh, before they get adapted to humans and start transmitting uh, between humans to humans, that becomes an epidemic. And if it spreads worldwide, then it becomes a pandemic. And there is three different mechanisms behind these uh, spillovers. So either the direct contact between the humans and the wildlife, um, or the indirect contact with their feces or urine, where the pathogens are often concentrated and excreted. Um, and there could be also a contact with an intermediary host, which could be a domestic animal um, or in, in breeding or just uh, pets, which uh, amplify the, the viruses. And that is the case for the MERS coronavirus in the Middle East with the dromedary. And it's been the case with poultry for avian influenza. Um, so, uh, what we also know is that uh, these spillover events have uh, the, the frequency have uh, accelerated over the past 30 years and uh, the percentage of zoonosis has increased as well. And this is highly linked uh, with uh, an impact of uh, human uh, uh, on the, the, the environment um, and the degradation of the environment or the reduction of the wildlife habitat, which is also linked uh, a lot with uh, increased human urban urbanization. Uh, studies have shown that uh, the number of uh, species in birds and mammals are correlated with the number of uh, diseases in humans. And we've also uh, know that uh, the environmental pressure linked to climate change has also an impact, as we've seen it with avian influenza and uh, the congre congregation of wild migra migratory birds that can transmit the disease to domestic animals or as we've seen with outbreaks of malaria, uh, which are often happening uh, after in intensive flooding. Those spillover events uh, are also um, increasing because of higher pressure on wildlife, which is linked to trade and consumption, and also with uh, intensified breeding, which are often not performed in, in uh, which are often performed in limited biosecurity and safety conditions. Um, and as it has been reminded by uh, Julia and Philippe, millions of communities worldwide uh, rely on these practices for food security, livelihood, or cultural identity. And if you want to, to feed the Congo Basin uh, to replace the 5 million tons of wild meat that are traded in the Congo Basin, you will have to, uh, to, uh, to have a surface uh, as big as what has been deforested in the Amazon to, uh, to uh, breed cattle just to give you an idea of uh, the, um, the, the, the size of this uh, wildlife trade. Um, so uh, the other uh, factor that highly influenced this acceleration in spillover is the human behaviors and the cultural practices, uh, which uh, increase the risk of transmission, such as consumption of raw meats or raw products, such as duck blood in Asia, for example, or limited biosafety practices when processing animals during the, the, the processing chain. Uh, but also the trade of wild pests can uh, increase these spillovers and uh, also ecotourism, uh, which uh, uh, includes uh, feeding practices. So what can we do? So we uh, have heard that banning uh, of uh, these practices uh, is not uh, a solution because that would have a major impact on local food security. And in some countries, it could have a, a very big impact on national economy and cultural identity. And uh, it will fail to secure uh, the, this, uh, the, the protection of the, the animals and uh, the, the, the long-term sustainable use of this uh, source of proteins. And what it will do, it will only bring this market to the illegal 
uh, zone, uh, as we've seen with the, the banning of uh, wet markets in Asia during the avian influenza crisis, which makes it very impossible to uh, control. So uh, we all know that prevention is better than cure. And uh, we also know that recent studies have shown that preventing emergence could reduce losses by a factor of 100. So what we need, we need to develop a risk-based surveillance approach, uh, integrated approach, uh, based on uh, the involvement of uh, local communities um, and also the actors of uh, the, the, the health sector, animals, humans, and environment to allow the rapid detection and control of rare events, which are uh, emerging diseases is a rare event, which is difficult to detect. So this has been implemented uh, in uh, uh, looking for surveillance for avian influenza in different countries worldwide, and it's efficient. So that is something that we need to strongly promote. So the, the only issue is that so surveillance system exists, but uh, there is a uh, very limited or even no surveillance system uh, along the wild, wild meat value chain uh, worldwide. And um, the, the issue is that this increasing risk of spillover uh, will only carry on to increase. It will not reduce either, even after uh, we have uh, resolved the, the current pandemic. Um, and this is because the human population keeps on increasing and uh, we also have uh, higher mobility. So as soon as a pathogen emerges somewhere in a few days or weeks, it has spread worldwide, as we've seen with the current pandemics, unfortunately. Uh, what we've also know for the past 15 years, there's been emergency pandemic preparedness plan, but they have mostly failed in main country, which is linked to uh, the great impact uh, of their implementation in terms of socioeconomic consequences, and also the impact on food security uh, uh, of this, uh, the, this, this plan, which might not have been anticipated. And what we also know is that the current crisis has highlighted the great limits of the current one else approach. So this integrated approach, which has mostly been limited to institutional collaboration so far with very limited actions in the field. So uh, in the past 20 years of research, this white paper tell us that we've learned that early detection is the key to prevent disease emergence and spread, but it requires long-term long -term to commitment and sustainability. So it's not a one-off approach. It has to be sustained on the long run. And for this, you need to develop low-cost approach that would be implemented by the people at the source of the emergence, as I said, the local community. And those people also need to be able to take rapid response to be able to prevent any spread of this spillover uh, to prevent uh, a potential epidemics and pandemics. And this will also require an, a need to have a constant dialogue and trust between the local community and the health sector, human, animal, environment, and the health authority. So how can we do that? This is something that uh, uh, I will leave the floor to my colleague Amanda Fine from the WCS to address these issues. Thank you very much, Marissa. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And a special thank you to those of you on opposite ends of the time zone that are up either very early or very late tonight. As Marissa said, I have been asked uh, primarily to outline the key recommendations coming out of the white paper that have been presented in the policy brief that's been made available. They fall under, as I said, three major categories. The first is prevention, really working to minimize the risks of exposure uh, to wildlife pathogens at the human wildlife livestock interface mitigate those impacts uh, by building resi resilience. This is broadly about reducing contact between wildlife and humans and their livestock, and therefore reducing the risk of the spillover of viruses of wildlife origin into human and livestock populations. A critical component of that is maintaining intact ecosystems, recognizing the rights of indigenous peoples and, and uh, local communities and the many generations for which they've protected these systems, but to work to halt further fragmentation, to look at how land use change affects the increasing contact with wildlife and therefore the potential for spillover, and really to promote um, in the land use planning process these concerns and this understanding of wildlife um, and infectious disease emergence. The other component I'd like to highlight under this area is an effort needed to reduce especially the urban demand for wild meat and the movement of wildlife from 
uh, habitats into human dominated landscapes and that process that allows the contact with humans, but also the mixing of species, the opportunities for wildlife and other animals to be co-infected with different viruses as they're moving along the wildlife supply chain and those conditions that are perfect to lead to the emergence of a new pathogen and pandemic potential. How to do this? Definitely to reinforce existing wildlife trade laws and regulations to promote food safety and uh, food security, and to especially work with local communities to find solutions that work for them and that fall within this broader framework of protecting global public health. The second um, major area for the recommendations is under detection, recognizing that early detection is critical both to identify viruses that are circulating and early case clusters of potentially new viruses before their large scale emergence. So recommendations to support effective frontline surveillance, to have local, make sure that local institutions on both the animal health side, as well as the human health, public health side and communities themselves can recognize what are uh, circulating viruses and, and early indications of a pandemic potential. The other component is to continue to understand uh, viral disease ecology and to be able to identify where the risks are greatest, to better understand how these pathogens evolve and spill over into human populations and cause the kind of pandemic we're seeing today with COVID-19 critical to engage and have leadership from national research and academic institutions in these hotspots for disease emergence. And as we've said, engage with local communities. They often are the ones that know most about uh, the kind of contact and the kind of practices that put them at risk and also uh, can lead to further spread and pathogen emergence. In the slide that's being shown, we saw some data from a study in Vietnam that looked at the live uh, rodent trade. And um, the study was done in collaboration with local communities, but also as a joint initiative with the public health sector and the animal health sector. It did, um, it did confirm concerns that the wildlife value chain is a driver of disease emergence. Looking here at coronaviruses broadly, we saw increasing numbers and diversity of coronaviruses in uh, the rodents as you go from small scale traders at the edge of um, natural areas through to large markets and then the end consumer. The final set of recommendations are broadly under how do we respond. And so the white paper as well as the policy brief emphasizes a One Health approach, having One Health policies and regulatory and operation systems at the national level to really to improve prevention and also preparedness and response. That One Health approach, um, important to acknowledge and therefore really support the role of the wildlife and the forestry sectors in disease prevention, their role in securing public health. They are um, the frontline agencies that are positioned to take action to address these upstream drivers of disease emergence we're talking about today, the forest fragmentation, habitat loss, and the commercial uh, wildlife trade. Joint action and political support across all the sectors will be critical. This is a big challenge and uh, it is not something that can be left uh, to the wildlife sector, for example, or only to the animal health sector, but it's really going to need the political um, power and position of all those sectors to um, address the risk of spillover and um, promote real change. And then finally, uh, coordination of all the initiatives. Uh, we heard from Philippe in the beginning about EU supported initiatives, the resources that are being mobilized. I think it's, it's critical for those to be uh, focused around a harmonized goal, one health for people and the planet. And it will be critical uh, to build back better in a post COVID-19 world if we are united under this one health approach. So I turn over now to Keith who will uh, expand on the one health approach and thank you all uh, for your time and participation. Thank you very much, Amanda. And um, it is a great pleasure to be here. And, and I really commend this white paper to be read and reread. I think it's been produced with great attention to detail. It's very balanced, it's pragmatic, and I think it will stand the test of time that we'll be going back to it in, 
in years to come. So firstly, to, to say in a world which there's so much negative news, uh, One Health is, is not about preventing the negative things of, of ill health. It's actually about taking a positive path to build better health for people, for animals and the environment. Sometimes we say, and the environment, but we, we maybe we should put that first, you know, that we're building a positive path to a better and healthier environment. And this white paper has a lot of practical ways which are, are really important to, to go about doing that. I'll suggest just a few that, to pick them out that, uh, for attention. Uh, one is really supporting the uh, restoration of ecosystems and with community rights as the basis and as a key determinant of sustainability. And they call in the white paper, they call this a comprehensive One Health approach to land use planning. That maybe is an application of, of One Health that we haven't given enough attention to before, but that paper puts uh, One Health in as a role in ensuring a consideration and progress towards intact ecosystems. Another is the One Health approach to strengthening and diversifying local food systems and livelihoods. And so here we need to recall that uh, tropical forests, particularly in Africa, are extremely unhealthy places for domesticated livestock. And that's helped protect them against grazing and browsing ruminants, but it's also limited possibilities for people to have alternative animal source foods. So wildlife harvesting has for reasons we've said, it hasn't had an essential role. Now, diversification of the food and income sources of wildlife dependent communities is essential, but that needs to be managed in a way that does not further risk the environment. So this One Health approach to diversified, safe local food systems is important and it's, and it's mentioned significantly in the white paper. One Health can, and in fact, must be applied at the community level. The, White paper gives examples of applying at One Health at community level, but these need to be scaled up and rolled out really to a much wider range of, of areas. So where do we need to apply the, the lessons on the, and the, um, the proposals in the white paper? Well, it indicates a One Health approach to targeting areas for wildlife disease spillover through identification of locations where there are high levels of interaction between wildlife, uh, eat livestock and people, um, focusing on degraded or at risk deforested ecosystems and where there's a dependency on wild meat or protein sources uh, or in food and live animal markets and where there's limited control of wildlife trade. The uh, SWM program has already identified a number of these locations where these things come together. What really impresses me hugely is the pragmatic community oriented solutions being proposed for exactly these sessions, settings, uh, which involve focusing on training hunters and wild meat processors to minimize exposure to disease, promoting efficient ways to preserve meat that will render potential pathogens harmless, and supporting regular health inspections along the value chain. Very practical, very applicable, but needing resources, needing training, needing health inspections, and making the basis of also for better surveillance systems. So this potentially builds something far better than a ban on trade in wildlife products or wildlife products for, for food in informal markets would achieve. So this is about building better in those settings. So coming to what we can do better, what can we do differently that the white paper suggests? One is the improving the One Health surveillance at the sites that the uh, SWM is proposing. Uh, a more joined up global approach based on integrated One Health surveillance, but starting from the bottom up. That is a process of surveillance which is risk-based, user-centered, developed together with local, and national stakeholders, including local communities and hunters. Connect this surveillance to testing for significant zoonoses through the national One Health platforms and FAO supports countries um, to do this in a number of the, the, the most important areas. And then ensure that data from that is useful for local decisions. It needs to be, that way it needs to become valued because it gets used in local um, 
local management of the risk. And what overall do we need to do differently? It also suggests very, um, very much that we need to engage and integrate with ministries of forestry and wildlife in a new way. Perhaps our One Health approach has been dominated in the past by the medical and veterinary professions. I recognize this needs to change and One Health approach really needs to uh, engage and receive the contributions of natural resource management professionals working in ecosystems, biodiversity and wildlife management. So FAO strongly supports the call in the white paper for in-service training for the ministries that are relevant to this to support One Health work, in particular, to build the capacities of forestry, wildlife, natural resource management uh, with One Health training programs, focusing on what they can do in their sectors. Carrying out joint trainings, working together with these professionals will be another way to, to focus on what is really a multi-sectoral approach. And we need also to assess the, the gaps in, in One Health programs to look at that whether there is adequate uh, natural resource, uh, if we're adequately representing the situation with resource management and wildlife in One Health at national level. So finally, does this add up to a new approach that the white paper, along with other co recent calls, does actually argue for a new approach going beyond the current One Health assessments, which are really to do with global health security and international health regulations, but talks about the need for an innovative One Health assessment that truly recognizes the role of the environment and the sectors involved in managing this in order to bring attention, investment and to build back better. Back to the moderator. Thank you for your time. So I think that's back to Julia. Thank you very much, um, Keith. Uh, it's been wonderful um, overview of what the white paper and the policy brief. Um, you know, all of you have um, given us a lot of food for thought at the moment. Um, before we go into the uh, question and answer session, I want to um, let all of our participants know about the uh, meeting platform Slido. And uh, those of you who haven't actually sent us any, any words yet, um, please do so now. And the question is, in one or two words, what is the main action that decision makers need to take to prevent a future pandemic. Uh, we, we're gonna have another poll later on if we have time, and it's going to be a um, slightly different question at the end. But we encourage uh, as many as you as possible to use the Slido link and uh, post them, um, you know, post the questions in the chat box so that we can have a look at those. Um, um, we have had uh, quite a number of questions, actually, um, which is very good. Um, we now also have 475 participants joining us, which is absolutely excellent. And I want to start with um, Amanda and Marisa, actually, and then I'll go on to Keith. Um, perhaps, Amanda, can you um, answer this question for us? Um, do you think implementing a ban or moratorium on the trade in live wildlife, differentiating between wildlife products would meaningfully reduce the risk of zoonotic disease spillover to humans? Thanks, Julia, and, and to the participants for your questions. Um, I think that, you know, any reduction in the movement of wildlife out of natural habitats um, and or even through captive uh, breeding programs and, and into um, human uh, dominated landscapes, primarily for food, even other products, any reduction of that will reduce risk. Absolutely. Um, a moratorium, I think uh, very context specific where action like that can be successful quickly, or um, there are definitely differences. I'm sitting here in Southeast Asia, 
And there's an increasingly support from the public as well as signals at the highest levels of government that we need to do something about the amount of live animal, live wildlife trade that occurs. And um, some really, you know, thinking uh, very constructively and, and forward thinking about how, how um, governments can do that and how communities can be supported to um, comply with new regulations and are supported potentially to phase out or phase um, into other types of livelihoods if they're directly um, uh, supported by the wildlife trade in terms of their livelihood or, or dependent. Um, I think my colleagues that work more um, in some other parts of the world where communities are directly dependent on the wildlife uh, product for protein could speak more to um, the feasibility of, of that kind of work in those contexts. But where it's a, a, a urban demand for what has essentially become a luxury product, I think there's definitely a role for moratoriums and um, that it will need resources, of course, uh, to support people that are currently involved in the trade, the legal trade of uh, live wildlife to um, transition transition out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, I have a second question. Uh, Marisa, please, uh, can you answer this? Um, assuming a ban or moratorium would be accompanied by significant funding from developed nations to help communities that depend on wildlife, food security transition, to alternative sources. In other words, um, will there be uh, significant funding from developed nations to help communities that depend on wildlife transition to other sources of food, protein, and livelihoods? Well, I don't know if there, I think there will be. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, well, this is part of the, the, the SWIM program is, is to, uh, to, um, to help this transition. Um, no, my, my, uh, my concern would be that uh, um, a ban or moratorium, if it comes too soon uh, within these transition steps, uh, as I mentioned before, would just move the problem to under the carpet and to the illegal zone meaning that uh, we will not reduce the risk, we will increase it. And we've seen it very clearly uh, with the crisis of avian influenza in Southeast Asia. They quickly banned the wet markets and it just uh, came into the background because people were not ready uh, to, to change their practices, whatever the risk were, and there was a huge impact in this region of this disease. Um, and I think it's also a bit the same even for the urban uh, preference because it comes to cultural uh, and uh, and personal uh, behavioral practices uh, which re require time for change so this change of practices needs to be um, uh, promoted it needs to be uh, developed and done with the people involved and it will take time because uh, it's not only a question of uh, uh, of uh, in some area, it's a question of food security, so that's another bigger issue. But it's also a question of preference and cultural practices, and this needs uh, a lot of work to uh, to make this evolve. Thank you very much, um, um, Marisa. Um, one last question for this particular uh, question and answer. Um, uh, to Keith, of course, um, how can we strengthen the monitoring and evaluation of the implementation of action points regarding mitigation of the risk of uh, pandemics? Gosh, thank you very much for that. Uh, that's a profound question. So the, how do we monitor and evaluate the, the actions we're taking to, to, exactly. to, to mitigate these spillovers? Um, so I think the, 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 there's, there's, several, there's several areas we need to look at for the monitoring and evaluation. Um, one of them um, must relate to having adequate measures for those, those risks. Um, and uh, those risks we've already talked about include the, the level of intactness of, of uh, ecosystems and, and, and a linkage between those measures and the, 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 the risks that they pose. So that's in the kind of in the prevention side, uh, thinking about the, uh, 
the risks of those degraded ecosystems? Uh, and do we, are we measuring that level of risk rather than simply looking at the pathogens themselves? Then there's the, the, the level of the, uh, let's say the One Health programs, which are there at those um, high risk um, intersections in the countries and regions and the locations. Then are those um, adequately representing the, the three areas that build up to risk of spillovers, risk of, of lack of detection? Um, so we already have some systems for, for looking at those, but perhaps not um, uh, applied equally everywhere. So we don't have a measure on that, um, that level of progress. Then there's a the question of, of um, how prepared are we to be able to react? And there are perhaps better measures for looking at the, uh, uh, the preparedness of countries um, uh, and preparedness of regions to work together. There, there's a number of measures which are, are currently being used to look at countries, but we don't have a we don't have this uniformly able we don't have a dashboard that we can say right at this moment this is the status of each country that's at risk to be able to compare them. Uh, we have a certain number of countries under that program, and then finally you could say what's our level of preparedness between between the international organisations for when events happen, and and this year has obviously been a huge test of interagency coordination when it comes to what to do about um, response to, to the pandemic. And, and I am sure that that system is being developed and improved as we speak, um, but clearly is one part of our overall um, monitoring and evaluation is how well have we done this year to manage what has happened. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, um, thanks again to our first group of speakers. Um, I think it's, it's been very good. Um, let's give um, a virtual round of applause to all of them, actually, if we can. Uh, well, I think we're now, we can now go into having a look at the results of our first poll. Um, I think it's been quite interesting. We have watched it um, evolve from, um, you know, a set of words that didn't make much sense to something that is quite coherent, or at least uh, there is a consensus, consensus in, in terms of what people are feeling. Um, let's have a look at that, that um, cloud, if we can. So it's very much highlighting biodiversity, conservation, we know fostering uh, sustainability, community sensitization, banning wildlife trade and stopping deforestation. I, I think these are very clear messages from our 400 and almost 500 participants that we have uh, attending this particular meeting. I think that that makes a lot of sense and um, they're definitely take home messages as well for us. Um, Okay, um, I think we are we are more or less on time, but uh, we've got to press on a little bit. Um, and our next activity um, will focus on the impact of COVID on different communities and uh, discuss ways in which we can improve preparedness within these uh, different um, groups of people. Um, we have three distinguished uh, speakers to join us here. And, um, you know, again, uh, we ask you to continue posting questions on the chat to all our panelists, um, like we did in the, in the first session, so that we can have a last round of question and answers at the end of this activity. I would like to first introduce uh, Mr. Michel Wapaza, who is the Deputy General Director of the Ministry in Charge of Wildlife and Protected Areas, the national focal point for a SWIM program in Gabon. I remind you, Gabon is a Central African country that has known already several outbreaks of um, zoonotic diseases in the past and very challenging for the entire country, but making head in terms of dealing with it and we can learn, learn uh, quite a lot from that. Um, Michel, bonjour, welcome. Bonjour. Uh, okay. uh, 
I can't see you. Um, are you um, are you there? Yes, you are. I can see you now. Okay. Um, let me start with uh, the first question. Um, unfortunately, I can't um, speak to you in French, but um, I think you know what the question is already. So, um, Michel, how has Gabon reacted to the pandemic and the risks posed by wildlife born diseases? Alors, euh, bonjour à tous et merci de de permettre au Gabon de participer à cet échange par rapport à la, à la résilience au COVID-19, les pays. Et le Gabon, comme, comme tous les pays du monde, hein, a été, euh, a été euh, surpris euh, par la vitesse de propagation du coronavirus et par toutes ses conséquences. Euh, et fait euh, au mieux pour euh, euh, gérer cette pandémie-là au quotidien. Euh, cependant, concernant euh, la gestion de, de, de la faune sauvage et liée à, la, à cette pandémie, euh, au Gabon, euh, depuis euh, mars 2020, euh, une, une mesure d'interdiction de, euh, de consommation euh, et de commercialisation euh, des, principaux, des, des principales espèces suspectes dans la propagation du coronavirus, notamment les pangolins et les chauves-souris, a été prise euh, par mesure de précaution. Euh, aussi, euh, beaucoup de séances de sensibilisation et de communication sur la question ont été euh, entreprises par le ministère des Eaux et Forêts euh, pour sensibiliser les commerçantes, mais aussi les populations locales, euh, dont euh, la manipulation et les risques de transmission, notamment par rapport aux, aux zoonoses causées par la faune sauvage. Thank you, Michel. Um, what is your country doing to prepare for future epidemics? Uh, comme tout le monde le sait, le Gabon est, a, possède une riche biodiversité en faune et en flore. Euh, cela implique aussi que euh, les populations gabonaises et ceux qui vivent au Gabon s'exposent beaucoup aux pathogènes qui, qui leur sont étrangers et font face euh, aux épidémies telles que comme on, comme on le sait, Ebola, euh, la fièvre jaune, ou aujourd'hui le cas de, du coronavirus. Euh, fort de ces expériences, hein, le Gabon euh, a d'abord euh, renforcé sa réglementation en matière de faune sauvage. Donc, euh, euh, en 2003, par exemple, on a interdit toute consommation de primates au Gabon. Et... Euh, les primates ont été ensuite euh, intégrés dans la liste d'espèces intégralement protégées. Et aujourd'hui, on a euh, euh, l'interdiction euh, de consommation de, des pangolins et des chauves-souris, qui, interdiction qui sera levée seulement si euh, les recherches démontrent que euh, les pangolins et les chauves-souris du Gabon ne sont pas euh, responsables de coronavirus. Mais euh, le Gabon a également, euh, à travers le ministère des Eaux et Forêts, que, que je représente ici, euh, renforcé, on va dire, sa collaboration avec, euh, avec les instituts de recherche, avec, euh, avec les instituts de recherche comme euh, l'Institut de recherche euh, en écologie tropicale, mais aussi avec euh, les laboratoires pour euh, que la recherche soit un peu plus affinée en matière de, non seulement de coronavirus, mais d'autres pathologies en lien avec la faune sauvage. Il faut dire que le ministère en lui-même euh, n'est pas aujourd'hui équipé pour, pour cela. Donc, on, est, on dépend beaucoup des, 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 des laboratoires, des instituts de recherche et, et des, des laboratoires, d'autres laboratoires de recherche internationaux. Thank you. 
What opportunities are there to work more closely with other sectors, for example, the public sector? Euh, avec la santé publique, bon, on sait que euh, dans le passé, lors de la gestion de l'épidémie Ebola, euh, le ministère des Eaux et Forêts a beaucoup travaillé avec, euh, avec le ministère de la santé publique. Mais on sait également la pandémie de COVID-19 vient nous rappeler vraiment aujourd'hui la nécessité de d'approfondir ces collaborations-là, de travailler, que ce soit euh, institut de recherche, ministère de la santé publique, ministère de l'environnement. Mais aujourd'hui, euh, en tant que tête, cette collaboration, on va dire, reste encore embryonnaire. C'est vrai que lors de, de la signature de l'arrêté d'interdiction, dont je vous ai parlé tout à l'heure, notamment sur... Euh, euh, l'interdiction de consommation et de commercialisation de pangolins et des chauves-souris. Euh, le ministère des eaux et forêts a initié euh, une collaboration avec euh, euh, le ministère de la santé publique, mais qui n'a pas pris. Euh, C'était peut-être que sur le coup, ils n'ont peut-être pas senti la nécessité de de faire, cette, de faire cette arrêté là avec, en collaboration avec nous. Et il faut dire que quelques temps plus tard, euh, le ministère de la Santé publique a quand même installé au sein de chaque administration une cellule de gestion de, des cas Covid. Donc, euh, c'était vraiment pour la santé des personnes, mais pour, euh, pour euh, les questions de gestion de, de, de recherche de cause de, de ces épidémies, on n'a pas encore euh, beaucoup travaillé dessus, mais c'est quelque chose qui reste à faire. Tout reste à faire. Thank you very much, Michel. Um, um, thank you for all your answers. Uh, we're going to now move on to um, Nicholas Fredericks. Um, I think for Nicholas, uh, unfortunately, he wasn't able to uh, attend in person or virtually, um, but uh, we did do a little video. Um, before our meeting, uh, just in case he wasn't able to, to come to us now. Um, Nicholas is uh, the current Toshao, the indigenous village chief for the Shunlinab uh, village uh, in Guyana. He's actually the chairman of different representative indigenous bodies in the country. And uh, he was able to answer some of the questions that we had for him before, and I think we have a little video to show you now. Uh. Nicholas, uh, welcome, nice to see you. How have your communities in Guyana sort of lived through the COVID-19 crisis? Hey, thank you for having me also. Um, in Guyana, the communities have managed to to survive through the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, by really living the life that they are accustomed to, by, 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 by having their families together. They were actually out of the villages into the forest by their farming areas where they have more access to food, fishing grounds, wildlife areas, um, gathering grounds. Also, also, they also use a lot of their bush medicine that they know about. Um, there are some plants here that, that, that we are using that's very good for the flu. And also I think, well, it's looking like it's very good for, the, for, for preventing the, the, the virus as well. So moving back to their farming lands, to the forests, and using the local med medicine that, that, um, that the indigenous people know about. You've learned a lot during the, you know, this particular period, um, you know, in terms of um, working with your communities to prepare yourself and to react to what's happening. So what do you think is needed to help these communities confront another threat in the future? I think um, more education, more, ed more material, um, more, more consultation with the indigenous communities. What is it that they really want? Um, 
So basic, basic items, ration, um, sanitizers, um, you know, allowing them to take control of, 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 of their lands in terms of monitoring who comes in and who goes out. That's what we're doing here, actually. Um, you know, we put them in that kind of position to, 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 to really safeguard. And also having ha, build like a communication platform where, where they can communicate their issues and we, uh, we can have we can have an interaction uh, with, with, with the communities themselves. Hmm. Yeah. So a lot of information sharing, you know, is, is, and education is very much needed. That's fundamental, isn't it? Uh, communication. Um, as you know, the use of wildlife has been implicated in the origins of COVID. How do your communities uh, perceive this potential threat, if there is any in, in your land? Yeah, at the beginning, there was some of the questions that were raised, whether this thing has any link to the wildlife, because we depend on the wildlife a lot for our food supply. Um, and, you know, even as of now, people are kind of skeptical about everything um, concerning this pandemic. So that, that is a kind of gray area where we, we kind of need some more information. And um, however, though, you know, we still continue to use the wildlife, we still continue as, as normal, but the, the, the question still remain as to, you know, what is the status of these wildlife? So we're kind of doing some biodiversity assessment, hopefully this year and early next year, to understand the health, you know, the health of, of, of these wildlife. But yes, definitely, that is a concern for, for, for us here. And I think through the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program, it's something that we can see how we, how, how we can bring some more information to the communities. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Nicholas. That's very informative. Um. Wonderful. Hello, Natalie. Hello, Julia. It's a great pleasure to introduce you. Um, you're a friend and a colleague and um, with an enormous amount of experience in both Africa and South America. Natalie Van Bilt is an associate researcher um, with us in C4 and also the site coordinator for the SWIM program in Guyana. Natalie, I have a few questions for you, of course. Uh, um, you are investigating the impacts of COVID on livelihoods and wildlife use in other Amazonian sites, uh, not just Guyana. Have you found similar trends, uh, similar patterns as those reported by Nicolas? Yes, indeed. Our findings in other parts of, of the Amazon region are really in line with what Nicolas just described in this video. Um, in many indigenous contexts, from, from, from the Amazon region, because of the lack of sufficient medical care facilities to cope with the disease, the only op option for them was actually to engage in voluntary lockdown. So the villages just closed down. Uh, this means that the, the crisis generally affected employment, income opportunities from different sectors, for example, from tourism, from transportation, trade, agribusiness, everything collapsed during the crisis. And during the crisis, the trade of food products was particularly affected. The prices of food increased steadily. So it totally disrupted the food security of vulnerable households in, in those contexts. But what we observed is that many households well, were actually able to adapt quite well to that difficult context. Because as Nicholas explained, people were able to go back to their farms. They relied on fishing, on hunting, on gathering for their food security. They also increased the size of their farm and started rearing local chicken uh, uh, for meat and eggs. So they were able to um, adapt to this difficult situation. Yeah. That's very interesting, actually. Uh, the um... You know, the resilience of local communities and the ability to actually come up to come up with uh, solutions to the problem. Uh, what do you think is a take home message uh, from the study that you're carrying out? Uh, um, what do you want to tell, um, you know, the world in relation to the response to COVID? 
Yes, I think the, the, the take home message from, from the way COVID was experienced by local communities in South America is that rapid adaptation in the face of this pandemic was possible and I think only possible for households where family cohesion persisted, where local knowledge, knowledge about traditional practices for hunting, fishing and farming was still alive and where access to farming grounds and forests and fresh water resources was secured. So where people could go back to their traditional uh, practices. So in actual fact, uh, the, um, the making sure that these forest ecosystems are still buoyant and, and, and carry on as they are, are fundamental, not just for the ecosystem themselves, but also for the communities that survive from them. Um, I mean, what you're telling us is that this wildlife use is part of the solution, isn't it, uh, to these communities and being able to go back to that. Uh. Sure, sure. The, 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 in those contexts, wildlife was part of the solution. Actually, the capacity of local communities to adapt during the crisis really relied on the fact that they still knew, they still had the local knowledge about subsistence activities they had secured tenure and rights for the use of forests and river resources and land. And of course they had healthy wildlife populations and healthy ecosystems. I think with, without those three pillars, the resilience of local communities would have been much more fragile. Hi, um, let me ask you one last question. We're running a bit um, um, out of time actually, but. Um, how do you think uh, SWIM is contributing to reduce the, uh, the likelihood of future uh, pandemics? Well, one, one way um, is that SWM contributes to reducing uh, spillovers by developing social marketing strategies to reduce white meat consumption in large towns where people are not necessarily dependent on wildlife consumption and by promoting food safety practices along the whole market chain. But I think most importantly, or perhaps we, we, we do not have to forget that also um, contributing at other levels is also important. SWM contributes to increase the capacities of local communities to adapt in types, times of crisis uh, by ensuring that national legal frameworks guarantee access to wildlife resources and land to indigenous communities, by supporting communities who engage in sustainable practices for hunting and fishing, by controlling other anthropogenic factors, for example, mining, logging, that may alter the health of wildlife ecosystems. And finally, by diversifying local food systems, particularly with regards to um, animal source foods. So I think there are different ways in which SWM contributes to reducing likelihoods of um, future pandemics. Yes. Thank you very much, Natalie. And of course, uh, encouraging traditional ecological knowledge, uh, which is so fundamental to all this. Um, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on, on to our second Slido poll. Um, we're very excited about what's going to come out in this one. And um, But before we move on to the question and answer, let me remind you again um, what our next question is, uh, which is very similar to the first question, but it is, what is the main action? that decision makers need to take to respond to a future pandemic. As previously, you can add as many responses as you like, and of course, do not hesitate to add new answers as we progress into the next uh, question and answer session. Um, okay, um, we have um, a few questions here to, um, you know, for the um, second question and answer. And a question to Philippe, uh, if you're still there with us, yes. Um, can you yes. tell us something about, um, you know, uh, how uh, electoral cycles are short, so there may not be much of an incentive to invest in prevention? 
How would you address that? How should governments address that? <laughs> Putting you in a bit of a fix there. Yeah, that's... Uh, so do, do we wait for the answer of the slide though before like that I have some time to, to reflect? Oh. <laughs> I, I've done it differently. Uh, we're going to do the Slido after you answer. No, indeed, indeed that's uh, the... Well, as you said, the electoral, electoral cycle are very short, uh, five, seven years, when it's like that in some countries, it's even shorter, or in... Uh, countries with, a, let's say, a very strong government. It's much longer, but it's not really suitable because it doesn't respect the human rights. So the difficulty is really to, to convince uh, the decision makers, but also the general public, that the, the measures that uh, they need to, to be taken are absolutely, absolutely necessary. And that's uh, a part of where the, in the democratic uh, countries, uh, where the, the elections must uh, really um, respect the, the willingness of the, of the people. That's, that's what we have seen in some areas huh? where, uh, the, for example, all the, those issues on the, on the climate uh, crisis were completely absent in, uh, let's say, 20 years ago. And now gradually, it's in some countries, it's present in nearly all the programs of all the parties in West uh, in Western Europe, it is present in, uh, in, uh, in the concern of all the parties. So we must, and this is due to the pressure of the public. So that's also a part of the, of the answer. We need to uh, really disseminate this uh, awareness in, in all, the, all the parts of, of the society and the decision makers will follow. And it will not uh, be uh, subject to one side of the, of the, of the political, uh, of the political, uh, what do you say, Ishiki? I don't remember the, the name of the one side of the of the of the parliament. So that's okay. that's probably a, a way to to do it. On the other hand, on the other hand, I must say that uh, regional organizations like uh, EU is less subject to uh, those political variations, and so at that level, we can uh, define and implement policies that are less subject to the the, 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 the short-term concerns. But otherwise, we must anyway confess that when there's a, a big emergency like the, like the COVID, some uh, big um, ecological concerns, let's say, a bit disappear in front of the emergency. So the, the, this level of awareness is not uh, at the level we, we should expect for the moment. But that's a bit, uh, my answer would be, on one side, the general public and the awareness of, of the general public and the regional integration and uh, regional organizations is probably a good, uh, a good way to implement long-term policies. So, and the UN, of course, especially uh, FAO uh, uh, in uh, a normative what, pro problem. Yes. What is very interesting about the uh, political versus the scientific world is how um, how difficult it seems to be for them to talk together and to come up with cohesive policies. Um, let's hope that happens uh, in the near future. Um, I have a question for Marisa. Um, this has to do with the whole issue of how do you actually stop um, you know, uh, diseases appearing, but, but how do you actually detect wildlife-borne diseases before they jump to human? Uh, is it a question of just uh, detecting what there is uh, in terms of viruses, bacteria, etc., or do we have to do other, other work? Well, because it's, it's like looking for a needle in, in uh, I don't know, you see it in English? In, uh... in a haystack. Stack. So basically, you can do a lot of research on the reservoir and then spend a lot of money because it's very costly to go in the forest to sample uh, bats and other species to look for the viruses, but you don't know which one is going to uh, come out of the forest and, and, and spill over. But it's, it is important to, to, um, to study these pathogens in their reservoir to be able then to uh, understand them better and to develop diagnostic tests 
to test them further up in, in, the, in the value chain. But uh, one um, thing that has been a bit uh, disregarded so far is the involvement of the local communities and uh, including a technical experts from the health sector, humans, um, veterinarians and medical doctors that are at the front line at this interface uh, where the disease can emerge. And those people um, need to uh, be involved uh, in the surveillance system, meaning they need to understand their role and their responsibility. And they need to be aware of being able to pick up what we call rare events. And rare events is a potential disease emergence. And, and also this idea of linking uh, uh, collaboration between uh, veterinarians, environmental people and medical doctors is if there is a, a, a very unknown disease in humans happening and at the same time they talk with their uh, neighbor who's a vet and is saying that he's just been talking with the environmental or the hunter in, in the forest saying that there is an, 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 a natural death of a wild animal that is currently happening this is all um, what we call um, uh, 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 triggers or like um, uh, indicators that something is happening and that needs to be looked up. And this is the only way that you can set up uh, efficient uh, and early detection of this event before they actually become a real problem and a, a, a cluster of spillover and then an epidemic. Thank you very much. Um... Very uh, useful, united front is what we need uh, to be able to do this. And I have another question. This question is for Nathalie. Um, uh, we have a participant that's actually written this question, um, you know, that wants to know a bit of what inspires you. But um, I'm going to um, read the question and then you can answer what inspires you to do what you do. Um, the main prerequisite to sustainability starts with party space three approaches. Uh, the question is, how often are local communities involved in meetings like this one? Um, and what inspires you um, is the, the sub question to this big question. <laughs> so okay. why haven't we uh, um, involved in local, we've had uh, tried, but um, I'll let you answer. Uh, we are. No, I think I think. Well, I'm super happy to to see that we have been able at least to involve one person mm -hmm. uh, who is a representative of different local communities in Guyana, um, because the, I think this is key, and and I appreciate the question of the of the participant because I think he he or she is very correct, and I think. Uh, community leaders, community representatives, community members um, have to have more space to participate in this type of debates. Uh, of course, there are logistical questions that um, uh, make it difficult for that to organize. Um, as you can see, this meeting is happening with high technology <laughs> and um, and this is not always possible uh, in uh, many remote areas. I am I am very thankful that the, the group organizing this um, this session has made all the necessary efforts to at least have one voice represented here. Um, but I do think that there there is a need um, and and this is not I mean this is at different levels at the international level. At the national level, I think you heard uh, Nicholas say as well that what he is, expects for the future is also more voices given to local communities about how to deal with this pandemic, taking into consideration local um, needs and the needs and requirements of um, indigenous communities and local communities as a whole, I would say. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, um, I have a question for Amanda. Um, the question is, how do, how do we approach a wildlife trade when it's a cultural value for a particular ethnic group? How do we deal with these tensions that obviously are going to arise? Uh, Thank you. Um, 
as I, I think at one stage, uh, Marissa said uh, that this is all going to take quite a bit of time, but I think we also need to take advantage when there are opportunities for significant shifts in behavior to be facilitated by, in this case, an incredible global crisis. And I'm, I'm, I see that um, in, I'm, I'm based in Hanoi and in, in Vietnam. This part of Asia has a cultural, long cultural tradition of wildlife consumption. Um, you know, some of it going back to uh, a reliance on forests and now in urban areas, much more um, of a, a luxury item. But the word on the street and you see in the public media is that you know this is time to change that. And a lot of people speaking out, both the young and uh, leaders of communities, um, th that it's sort of time to address what um, is a, not only a risk, but also uh, an unsustainable uh, driver of uh, something that is not uh, supportive of planetary health and a green recovery. I mean, people are talking about that in these societies in, um, in Southeast Asia. So um, I do understand there are some communities for which it, uh, you know, wildlife consumption is, is a, a part of, um, you know, a cultural belief beyond a luxury item. Um, and I think um, in, in many cases though, in, in, including in this region, there's actually, uh, with the expansion of populations, there's, there's been an increase in the offtake level for that practice and therefore uh, on the road to unsustainability in terms of that practice itself. So I, I think, we all need to work together, definitely, definitely listen to local communities. I think in many, many cases, they can identify solutions themselves that can help um, guide the kind of support that can be provided by international programs and, and, uh, and, and donors so that it is the most effective and has the highest impact. Thanks. Thank you very much, Amanda. And I think that's fundamental to, to work with communities that themselves so that they can change their perspective towards trade if that's what they want to do. Uh, I have a last question here for Keith. Um, and it's um, how can we ensure politicians translate uh, the One Health approach into local policies correctly, into their own policies correctly. Thank you. Um, it's, it has been a, a, a challenge uh, up until now, perhaps up until 2020, to have uh, truly interministerial uh, agreements on One Health. There's quite a lot of technical agreement between the, the uh, relevant health agriculture ministries about One Health, but truly uh, intergovernmental departmental approach to One Health, there are relatively few countries. But I think this year is really one which has been a wake up call on the need to, to have that uh, uh, interdepartmental cross cabinet uh, agreement that we do need to have this approach, not only at the cabinet level, but very much at the community level. So I think I think this is this this is a call that needs to be made at every every level from from the the, the population to their 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 politicians and and at the the highest level as well down to to governments. You know how well is your One Health approach um, being organised at the cabinet level to be applied at the community level. Uh, so I think we, we, we have seen a few countries that have taken the lead to, uh, to do that, to, to consider that they, they must have that joined up approach. Um, others are on that pathway, but I think the arguments to do that are really uh, so strong that, that um, and they need to be reiterated. We, we cannot just have technical solutions to something that affects the whole of society. Thank you very much, Keith. That's, that, that's very, very... Um... Inspiring, actually. Thank you very much. Um, shall we go to uh, the Slido poll? Um, I think we should have an image there that tells us 
something about the second question. Um, <laughs> well, there you are. Education, education and education. And don't panic. Um, that seems to be the clear, clear one. So. Okay, I think we're approaching um, the next session of our meeting. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers for the valuable contributions. I think we've learned a lot and we've also been inspired and motivated to look into other things as well. Um, so before we close, um, uh, let me share the results again of, of the second poll. Um, so that we, we have a look at that uh, again. I'd like to have a look at that uh, again, um, because I'd like to make the point that um, what is coming through in that second poll is the fact that we need to be uh, calm about uh, and, and motivated about uh, the way forward. And uh, let's take education and don't panic as our, our little um, mottos uh, for, for the work that we need to do. I think they are quite important two words or three words, uh, don't panic and educate and, and move forward. Um, I think we are um, now ready for our call for action. And I'd like to um, uh, introduce uh, Ms. Um, Pratt um, to give us a closing remarks to the uh, sessions, please. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. On behalf of the Organization of African, Caribbean and Pacific States, the OACPS, and its Secretary uh, General, His Excellency Georges Ribello Pinto Chakotti. I would like to thank each and every presenter um, and every participant attending this session, tackling the risks of wildlife-borne disease pandemics, policy and investment priorities. Um, this session of the Global Landscape Forum's Biodiversity Digital Conference I'm sure that you would agree that the presentations and contributions during the session provided us with a richness of the issues and risks that we face, as well as ideas and initiatives and solutions that we should be considering in moving forward regards wildlife-borne disease pandemics. I commend to you all the white paper and policy brief, Build Back Better in a post-COVID 19 world, reducing future wildlife-borne spillover of disease to humans. It is a product of the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program, an intra-ACP EU-funded initiative under the 11th European Development Fund that is being implemented by a consortium of delivery partners and, as we've already heard, FAO, CIRAD, C4 and WCS. I congratulate all partners of the uh, Sustainable Wildlife Management Program for this initiative. So my closing comments will be brief, as I would like only to share with you a handful of key messages, messages that will remain with me from this session and from the white paper. First, that the effective implementation of integrated public health solutions, such as the One Health approach, will require effective national policies and will need significantly higher levels of additional investment and will require sustained attention. Second, that we need a coordinated and risk-based approach to really focus on and target priorities. And especially given that we must face the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences. Third, that we need to embrace environmental and biodiversity solutions as essential and consider these as fundamental imperatives of the One Health approach. Fourth, that we need to tackle the emergence and spread of diseases through sustainable natural resources and landscape management with better data and information to improve assessments of zoonotic risks and the control of wildlife trade and consumption, so as to inform better policy and practice decisions. 
I believe that if we can commit to work together towards achieving these goals, we can be confident that we can achieve a brighter future for people and wildlife, which is, by the way, the slogan of the Intra-ACP Sustainable Wildlife Management Programme. And so with those few words, I thank you again for your participation. I thank the moderator for managing the last one and a half hours. That has been invaluable, I'm sure, for all of us. And I wish you all a very good day or a very good night. Thank you. Well, there's very little uh, left to say, except again, thank you, uh, Christelle. Thank all of the speakers, all the panelists. Um, and all the participants, I'm, I'm extremely happy that we've had such an enormous amount of response from all over the world, I'm sure. There are 564 attendees already with us. Um, we encourage you to read the white paper, to use the white paper as much as you can, and to make a better world. And thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.